Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to take some time uh, with our Ames DM-1000. And uh, this is just going to be a teardown, kind of see what's in here, get a look at the build quality. As a reminder, um, this is Harbor Freight's latest, greatest multimeter, the DM-1000 here. And we've got a pretty decent meter construction-wise, or Sorry, we've got what looks like a pretty decent meter feature-wise. This is comparable to the old 7-in-1, 14-in-1, 5-in-1. They've rebadged it, deciding on how to count the, what's the word I want to use here, functions a few different ways, but fairly comparable to the old Centec P9-8674 with a much easier to remember name. Few things missing that I guess people just didn't use on the Sentec as much as I do. There's no acoustic measurements on here. There's no light sensor, um, but it does appear to keep and improve the roots of the meter. So I'll set that over there. Now, as a reminder, this is not going to be a surprise when we get in there. Um, we know Mass Tech is the ODM for this meter, but Harbor Freight has told me they had a decent amount of input on it. And unlike the older model, it doesn't line up directly with any of Sentech's meters. And what I mean by that is, or sorry, with any of Mass Tech's meters. And what I mean by that is this is a Mass Tech 8229. It looks like it, the circuit board says it internally, and you can literally just go buy an 8229. And that's not a bad thing. That's not an abnormal practice. Everybody, Herber Freight, Home, Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace Hardware, Menards, they all say, I want product on my shelf. And then they go to someone that can make it for them. And sometimes they make things themselves. Harbor Freight owns factories that make a lot of their tools. But other stuff, that's a little more specialized or complicated, they'll go to someone who says, okay, you make multimeters, in this case, and I want something similar to this item that's in your catalog with this list of changes. And there'll be negotiations and things like that, and there'll be adjustments to how that behaves. So this is not gonna quite line up with anything that MassTech produces, Although it may look similar and may even have an MS model number on the printed circuit board. Don't know yet. Um, I have been using it for a while. I haven't had any oddities or anything behave strangely. I've mostly used it on D uh, low voltage DC, 12 volt, 5 volt, some 24 volt stuff. As well as a bit of household level AC. And I did hook it up to 220 circuit at work that we were trying to troubleshoot, but... I didn't get very far other than saying, hey, there's no power here because, frankly, I'm not a licensed electrician and we have insurance at work that says we need to call in a licensed electrician. So although I'm allowed to say, hey, this outlet's dead, there's no voltage on it, um, I'm not really allowed to open up the wall and start playing with it. I can at home, not at work. All right, so first off is this rubber impact resistant cover. And uh, I haven't dropped my meter enough to necessarily test this, but it seems to work. I do know that it works on my 822, well, my older Centec meter. All right, it looks like there's a screw I've got to take out first. Otherwise, I will rip it. Go ahead and use Warrior 19 and 1 screwdriver set. Alright, so that comes off. And then there's that, which exposes the Thunderbolt Magnum battery. This is, by the way, not my favorite battery to see. Harbor Freight has two different lines of non rechargeable batteries. I might have a third, but they've got two primary ones that I'm usually concerned about. They have the orange 
alkaline Thunderbolt Magnums and the yellow heavy duty Thunderbolt Magnums. These are zinc chloride cells. They don't really do well in high drain applications, which granted a multimeter is not. Um, but they are an older formula. This is an alkaline battery. This is what you want in most of your high draw devices. And typically I find they last a bit longer than the heavy duty batteries, even in a low draw application like the DM1000 here. So I don't know what the cost differential is to Harbor Freight on the uh, batteries. All right, so it looks like I've just got four screws, which that makes this a bit easier time than I had when I opened up my Centec meter, which maybe I should do that again. Just as a comparison point. So there's a fifth screw here. Which I don't know. Ah, okay. So that hides not one, but two fuses. So we've got a 10 amp fuse. Rated for a thousand volts. And this one is not marked. But that says 600 milliamps at 1,000 volts. So we've got one high power fuse, one low power fuse, which is actually good. Um, I like seeing multiple fuses. That tells me that... Okay. So, yeah. Max 600 milliamp fused. Max 10 amp fused. Every 30 seconds... Maximum 30 seconds every 15 minutes. Okay. So I like having independent fuses. I also like that they're relatively easy to get to. Um, two screws to get to the fuse housing, although I didn't take them off in that order. I would have liked if the smaller fuse was marked but that may simply not be up to them. All right, so let's get this out of the way. All right, so there's a spring that's attached to a section of foil here. It's supposed to do non-contact voltage detection, and I wonder if that's what that is is to allow it to read the differential between this and that plate. All right, so I see a couple of things. As I see the current path that this takes goes directly through that fuse and then jumps through necessarily as large of a wire as I would like to see, but a pretty hefty size wire um, with a second layer of insulation. So if you have 10 amps jumped through this, it is not just relying on the printed circuit board. There's actual dedicated pathing for that. I see we've got a little speaker there, which I've heard it make a couple of beeps, so no surprise there. Actually, before we get on here, According to this, this says it's an MS8251 version B, which I don't think quite lined up. It looks really similar, but not quite a dead match. So it's definitely based on the 8251 series. Now, like I said before, it's not abnormal to turn to an ODM for something like this. And honestly, Mastec is far from the worst choice you could have for building something like this. Let's go ahead and bring this in a little bit. We're going to cut and refocus to make sure that we can see the board. Alright, so we've got a ton of stuff going on here. As I mentioned, we have a dedicated current path for the high power 
It is marked as an 8251B. Um, this particular board says it's revision 1.0, 2016-0829. And let's see here, we've got one chip here that is probably the brains of the operation, an HY11P14RJN59. And then I've got a second smaller chip here that would probably be... either a display driver or a second subset of functions. Um, so that may add additional functions to the primary chips, such as the uh, thermocouple for temperature measurement or the non-contact voltage sensing. It may be features above and beyond just what it can handle out of the box. So I think with those four out of this whole assembly. There we go. It was the actual inserts here. Pretty typical construction for a multimeter like this. Um, we've got this contact pad array and a rotating dial. Now one thing I did not anticipate seeing is that this has a pair of springs and ball bearings that go in like that and I popped one of these out which is bad since I don't really know which one I popped out I don't like this particular assembly with these little these are the contacts, which are fairly standard, but they're not fused into this plastic in any way. So when I took it apart, this one here, which I was able to identify because there were wear marks in the plastic, popped out. Now I've got it back in, so it's not the end of the world. And then this is designed to Rotate and I, I do like that the uh, The ball bearing and spring gives a very secure feeling as it rotates Along these bumps So I like that. That's good. I like seeing that um, Kind of surprised to see that these Can go with their Associates here. All right, so on this side of the board, there's nothing super surprising. We do get to see a few nice features. Uh, number one, we've got some very heavy solder bridges, making sure that there's no issues when we try and run 10 amps through that fuse. Um, and I see a little bit right on this solder point here where it looks like it off gassed a little bit during um, beyond that we've got an LED here the screen which was easily visible so looking at the screen we can see a pretty heavy lens here we also can see that it's assembled in basically three layers we've got a thick lens um, I'd say that's about an eighth of an inch thick we have a pretty hefty LCD and then we have a backlight layer behind that all sandwiched into this assembly now none of these components themselves are probably too difficult to um, Replace I've seen LCDs like this before in things like calculators and They just kind of line up 
There's no soldering, there's no pins, there's nothing like that to fight with. So they're fairly easy to swap out. Um, same thing with the backlight here. It's just a two pin backlight assembly, probably an off the shelf component that would be easy enough to source. It's really the lens that would be hard to find. Although the LCD itself, I believe is custom by Mass tech, so it's not like I can just go buy one of those either. All right, moving on. Pretty typical button contact uh, membrane here. I do like these contact pads. These are very fine multi-gap contacts. The one thing that I don't see in here that if you were to purchase this and go through with the disassembly that I might encourage end users to add I don't see any dielectric grease on the dial here, which means that should a corrosive material get through the housing of the meter, uh, there's a good chance, and this is actually the typical failure point on a meter this style, is that it could corrode these pads or these fingers and cause them to not make contact properly. And usually the giveaway, if that's the solution to, or sorry, the failure of a meter, is that if you sit there and you wiggle the dial back and forth a little bit, it'll start to work again, and it'll work right for a couple of days, a couple of months even, and then, you know, it sits in the box, maybe it gets humid on one day, corrodes again, and then it's dead. And you fiddle with it, and it suddenly works again. So, I, I would like to see some dielectric grease on here. Um, I don't think there was any on my 8229 either, but I don't typically go into any kind of high corrosive environments, so that's usually not an issue for me, at any rate. So, let's talk for a second about what I don't see and what I do see on the back again. Older meters. My Centec meter, some cheaper ones I've worked with, generally older designs, you would have trim pots on the board. And the purpose of those trim pots would be to calibrate the meter. So you could take it, you could measure it against a known load, and then fiddle with that potentiometer to say, well, I'm reading 10.1 volts on a 10.0001 accurate output source. And you would plug it in, and you would turn the correct potentiometer until your meter read 10 volts. And then you'd go through and check a couple of other voltages as well. And you could do the same thing for resistive loads or uh, AC loads. The, the long story short there is you could calibrate the meter. This one, I don't see any trim pots. What I do see are these two little pins here that say CAL1, which tells me that this meter is calibratable, but requires uh, higher end equipment than you would have needed for one of the older ones. Now, whether or not that's good or bad is really up to the end user. From my standpoint, I don't do anything sensitive enough that I've needed to calibrate one of my meters most of the time. And if I did, I probably wouldn't calibrate either of these. I'd probably calibrate my bench meter, which is built the old-fashioned way with trim pots. I'll reassemble it off camera. Um, the DM1000, I don't have any trim pots. If I wanted to calibrate this, I'd have to pay someone to do it. And I just don't know how much that costs. Let me look it up. Yeah, so calibration prices I'm seeing are kind of all over the price. Um, a basic meter like this, the best estimate I can see is that Fluke themselves offers calibration for similar meters in about the $80 range. I haven't seen anything particularly egregious with this. That said, 
I'm not sure I'd go spend 80 bucks to calibrate an $80 meter. Um, it just economically doesn't add up. The older method was easier to calibrate yourself. Um, so I would love to hear in the comments below what people think about the use of a digital calibration, which is probably an easier process on the manufacturer. They probably have a, a two-pin serial communication that they can plug this in and wire it up to four different devices. You know, just plug in the probes and start the calibration program and walk away. Uh, versus using trim pots, which, yeah, I guess you could automate it, but odds are is going to be a by-hand manual process with human intervention. Uh, Personally, I'm more inclined towards that because I can do that myself. This meter is a newer design and a higher quality design than my older meters. But calibrating it would be something I'd have to hire someone to do. All right. Let's just do one last quick peek and check out a few things. I like that spring. That's a clever solution to that problem. Um, on the back here, I don't see any cold or weak solder joints. I don't see anything of any particular concern here. Um, I understand why they do this. I'm just not a huge fan of this method of construction. And what I'm talking about is they're are two holes on the printed circuit board here that the 9 volt connector goes through, comes back, and then solders down to. I just don't like 9 volt batteries in the first place. I'd rather have some AAAs, which is what some of my other meters use. Um, however, given the option to do this, I would love to see a modular connector here because this part is a failure point. I don't know how many of these I've seen snapped in half because people twist and lever and really crank on them. And I'm sitting there putting what should be a single terminal connector in one post at a time, or I'm trying to re-solder a new 9-volt lead in. So there's my thoughts on that. Uh, let's see if I can read off that little calibration chip there. That is a N203DTA0660LRJP53.C. And just as a reminder, the main chip is an N202HY11P14RJNS9. Um, so interesting choice there now i'm going to reassemble this off camera because i do want to take a couple of photos of these chips in the printed circuit board to show a little bit more detail um, overall the assembly process looks pretty straightforward the hard part if you want to call it that is just going to be getting this lined up which if I set it to the off position, yeah, that was easier to line up than I thought. So it'll just be setting this back in. I know that I need to put a little force on that. And then these screws are gonna wiggle a little bit when I go to put them in, but they shouldn't be too bad. All right, folks, that is the Ames DM-1000. Um, Overall, this looks like a well-built meter. I haven't had any issues with it. There's a couple of fit and finish or a tweakable things that I would like to see addressed. Uh, number one is that I wasn't supposed to get a thermocouple that said MS3204. Uh, I was supposed to get one that said Ames or Harbor Freight or something of that nature. Honestly, somebody just grabbed a bin of the wrong thermocouples when they were putting these together. Um, beyond that, I'd like to see these replaced with an alkaline battery. I haven't had great experience with the heavy duty. Zinc chloride can be a leaky mess when they fail, although alkaline can too. 
Um, I just don't like 9 volt batteries in general, so that's the you're never going to make me happy. Even if they had included a fancy lithium one, I'd still go, why do I have this? Why don't I have double A's or triple A's? I, which I guess I shouldn't hold against them, since if there's nothing they could have done there to make me happy, well, I guess I just don't like 9 volts. Other things I would have liked to have seen at this price point, um, probably the biggest one is data logging. There's a couple of meters available in this price point that aren't quite as capable. They're not as good of a meter. Uh, but they do have a USB port on them. And if you told me that they could make this exact meter and for another 20 bucks, throw a USB or a serial port on it so that I could record data, that would immediately make it more useful to me. The reason I have the bench style MS8040 is so I can plug in its serial connection and record temperatures. So um, we, I do have a Bluetooth handheld meter, which is ironically also a Mastec OEM, although it's by a different vendor. It doesn't do the data logging side. It just reports a single temperature. So there's, there's give and take there. Personally, giving me a USB port would be the best thing they could do. All that said, um, as always, I, I do want to say Harbor Freight sent this meter in for a review. I promise you guys, I'm not being nice to this thing. I'm just being fair. This is an $80 meter. I could tell you everything that it doesn't do that an $800 fluke does. That's not the person this meter is for. This meter is for... People like me, probably my average viewer, maybe a little bit beyond some of them, who need a meter that will read AC voltage, that will read DC voltage, that isn't going to be an issue if I'm working on my car, my house, and sometimes my computer. There's no reason I can't use this to check my PC's power supply. It is not going to be a huge voltage analyzer that I can plug in and watch everything down to the thousandth millivolt. Uh, as it runs in real time, those are $10,000 pieces of equipment in some cases. This is a general, all-purpose, I'm going to say contractor-grade meter. And what I mean when I say that is the person who's installing a furnace, installing an air conditioner, water heater, normal household homeowner level appliances um, and entry-level commercial stuff this is going to do all the things they want it's got a thermocouple I can throw it in the furnace and see that you know it's running a hundred degrees too cold because there's a clog in one of the nozzles so it's not heating up as much as it should or my hot water is only heating to 90 degrees because my water heaters electrode is not right it has non-contact voltage, it has frequency, I can see if I'm getting 120 volts at the wall, I can see if I'm only getting 50 hertz instead of 60, I can do all of the stuff that I need to troubleshoot all the electronics in a home without issue. The guy who's installing a generator in a hospital that costs a six-figure number that is the size of your house is not who this meter is for. Although, frankly, I've seen those guys use this one, and the only thing they told me it didn't do was three-phase rotation. So it's all about picking the right tool for your job. You can tell me in the comments, and I'm more than happy to see them. Well, hey, this one's better, or, well, it doesn't do this thing. And I'll make sure to poke at those when we do an actual, like, test on this. I, I took it apart. I haven't tested anything on camera. Um, 
Although I have shown it on camera using the thermocouple, benchmarking thermals on many PCs and devices of that nature. So anyway, once more, we're, we're just trying to frame it for the right user. Um, frankly, I actually like the older model better because it does a couple more environmental features that the new one doesn't. But that's just me being old and stubborn. I want to thank, as always, anyone who help, uses our Amazon affiliate links or helps support Pocketables by subscribing or on Patreon. It is support like that that helps make videos like this possible. I want to thank Electrix for providing our opening and closing themes. And finally, thank you for watching.